Kevin Jabal, Ali Abdal, Maggie, and Zach Hiley have now left. Is it still worth it to become a doctor? I'm a doctor, an anesthesiology resident in New York City. And I also make YouTube videos and run a business. And after watching video after video, hearing reasons why they left, I'm not gonna lie, there are many moments I considered leaving too. But for now, I have no plans on leaving. And here's why I'm choosing to stay. One, Dr. Dr. RTF. Zach writes that he felt his impact was limited and that the day-to-day -day responsibilities didn't match the ideals that first drew him to medicine. And to some extent, I definitely agree with him. There are certainly days exactly like that. During my first year of residency, we did three months straight of internal medicine. And I cannot count the amount of times that I was woken up, paged, visited in person, only for a nurse to tell me to click a bunch of buttons on the computer to renew the Foley catheter. RTF, renew the Foley. By policy, a doctor has to renew this tube that drains the patient's bladder every day to make sure that we think we still need it. And my thought is, bro, if I didn't renew the Foley this very second, would you have yanked it out of the patient? Do you really need me to press this button at 2.17 a.m.? So yeah, there are a ton of days that are exhausting simply because you remember you're a doctor, you trained for 10 years, and all you're doing is being a glorified note computer pressing monkey. But there are many days that aren't like that. Recently, I took care of a very sick three month old baby boy who needed surgery to drain the extra fluid within his brain. I remember spending what felt like 30 minutes with the patient's family, walking them through every step and every precaution we were going to take for their baby boy. Family personally had very poor experiences with healthcare, and this time the added stress of a young child was a lot to bear. And when everyone was ready, I remember that split second when the mother handed her child to us. And I won't ever forget that combination of focus, pain, and emotion in her eyes. Right at that moment, it felt like I had entered some sort of flow state. And still to this day, I remember every detail about that case. Everything felt so vivid and so charged. And while that child has a long ways to go, there are few things in my life that felt more meaningful than bringing that child back to the recovery area, back to his parents, having safely taken one step forward in his care. And maybe this is just the way that I'm wired, but I find that these deeply positive, meaningful moments stay with me far longer than those thousands of annoying paper cuts. And it's these moments that separate your application from tens of thousands of other pre-meds who are also scribes, also EMTs, also hospital volunteers. Real strong extracurriculars have nothing to do with the title of the activity, but rather it's the people, the independence, and the impact you make. In fact, two people can have the exact same resume, but the pre-med who makes the most out of their extracurriculars will become a doctor. So if you want to get into med school, take a look at real pre-meds who actually got in. We have eight full AMCAS applications that earned acceptances to the best programs in the country. My own application that got into UCLA is on there. Over 13,500 pre-meds are now part of our community. To join, click the application database link in our description box below now. Two, the money. Is it that bad? Maggie shares that her financial aspirations may have not been met by a career in medicine. She talks about these dreams of living in the Midwest with a seven-figure business and a 60% profit margin so she can take a big trip every quarter. And look, that's her value system, and I am in no place to say that is wrong. I don't share some of those same values, so it's a bit off-putting to me, but I do understand the financial points she makes. In 2023, she shared that she made $190,000 as a medical student. Zach Hiley writes that last year he took home $100,000 from YouTube AdSense and courses alone. As a first year doctor, we at Mount Sinai took home about $57,000 after taxes. Working close to 65 hours a week, that's about $17 an hour. Not the biggest of bucks. Maggie and Zach were not working 65 hours per week on their business. And yet they made two times, three times as much as I did in the hospital. So I get it, not to share any specific numbers, but our business pre-med catalyst makes 20 times as much as I do in the hospital. And there are many reasons most people don't go into medicine for the money. While you will make a great living, it takes a very long time. Couple that with the huge debt burden, and if you invest that same amount of time and effort in other fields, you'll likely make much, much more 
They're not telling you to become a YouTube creator and an entrepreneur because as someone who has co-founded his own business, that life isn't all sunshine and rainbows either. And I'm not saying that making YouTube videos is anywhere as hard as being a doctor, but there are key differences. For example, the business works at all times of day. There are fires to be put out on weekends. I'm making content right now at 4 a.m. on a weekday before going to the hospital. We have a payroll where we pay full salaries for real people who have to support their families. And when the business doesn't succeed and the amount of businesses that do not succeed is staggering, that is extremely stressful. And compare that with the amount of doctors who graduate residency and don't have a job. That number is very little. The job security in medicine is unparalleled. Physicians do very well financially. Their salaries are guaranteed. The average physician makes $300,000. Maggie wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I am an anesthesiology resident. Our average salaries are $450,000 to $600,000, depending on where you live. I have no idea what I would do with that much money. But ultimately, if you're anything like me, the ideal career has finances as just one component. What also matters is satisfaction, flexibility, autonomy, purpose. No, you won't make the same amount of money as a tech billionaire. But even if you value finances significantly, being a doctor puts you in the top 5% of all of America. Number three, the Libby Zion Law. Libby Zion was an 18-year-old college freshman who died in 1984. She died likely because of a lethal drug administration administered by an overworked resident. And the Libby Zion Law was created in New York in response. Physicians should work no more than 24 hours continuously and no more than 80 hours a week. I know it seems crazy, but for med students and pre-meds, this amount of work is normal. In fact, older generations of doctors think that we're soft and working too little now. But if you take a second to spit out the Kool-Aid and take one step back, you'll realize that this isn't normal. Most jobs do not have anywhere close to this problem. Just last week, I worked a full day. I set up my operating room at 6 a.m. for a big ear, nose, throat surgery that ended at 8 p.m. that day. And once I was done, I finished up the other operating rooms that were still going up until 11 p.m. Then I went to go see a kid who had a big urology surgery earlier that day and whose epidural was not working. Then I saw some new sickle cell patients in the emergency department who were having pain. Finally, I got back to the call room to sleep at 12.30 a.m. And the second that I dare closed my eyelids, I got a phone call and was asked to set up for an emergency surgery. A patient had come in with a cold leg because of an artery blocked, and that surgery took until 4 a.m. At 4 a.m., I'm not my best self. Our hours are dangerous. And paradoxically, we pair the most tired doctors with the most emergent cases at a time when we have the least resources. It's not good. And every call shift like that burns me out just a little bit more. And of course, at 6 a.m. sharp, the bagel guy called and I walked downstairs like a zombie to pick up the bagels for the department. And even after I graduate residency as an attending anesthesiologist, call life will be part of my career. And I can understand why people don't want that. Ali Abdal left to transition to his full-time creator and entrepreneur life. He now has both time and location freedom. He makes his own schedule. He lives with his wife in Hong Kong. And those are things that I can't do as an anesthesiologist. But there's nuance and there's options here. When I graduate residency, I won't have to work 24 hours. Most attendings actually come in at 4 p.m. for their overnight shift. And many other anesthesiologists have built careers that have flexibility built in. Some anesthesiologists only work two days in the operating room, and the other three days they protect for research and education and administrative work. In my program, I work on projects related to artificial intelligence and intraoperative teaching. I'm trying hard to build a niche for myself. And that expertise outside of clinical anesthesiology has earned me protected time outside of the operating room. All this to say, yes, we work a ton, but this varies widely between specialties and career trajectories. It's not so black and white. And if you don't want to work these obscene hours, you likely don't have to. And to me, the most forgotten and most underrated attribute in the best pre-meds is this, it's this high agency. It's this ability to independently carve out your own path. And if you're applying to medical school in the coming year or two, I recommend writing in a way that highlights this agency. 
that makes it clear that you get things done. It's worked really well for our students here at Premed Catalyst. Our premeds who submit their applications on time have a 100% acceptance rate. That's more than double the national average. And our results are because we work so closely with students. We can only take four students per month until we're full. If you'd be interested in getting into some of the strongest programs in the country, click the application cycle advising link down below to book a free strategy call now. Four, shelf life. I have to give props to the OG, Kevin Jabal, who made the first I'm Leaving Medicine video I ever watched. Since then, I think his leadership has given more permission to share their stories. And I think it's a good thing. Many people were leaving medicine before YouTube, and being a doctor isn't the best path for everyone. Dr. Jabal talks a lot about administrative burden, being burnt out in a healthcare system that values efficiency over patient care. I've experienced that a ton. I've been woken up for surgeries that honestly shouldn't be done at 3 a.m. And they're done because the hospitals don't have enough staffing, so they have to churn out these extra cases in the early, early morning. These practices burn real doctors and hurt real people. And they can be very unsustainable. I'm still early in my career, and for now, this is just my personal philosophy. I tell myself that it's a privilege to work on things that I care about. These situations suck, but for the time being, these patients still deserve care. And it takes a mental fortitude to say that I'm going to do my best in spite of all of these negative influences. I'm going to get the job done anyway. I'll do my best not to complain and bring positivity to a shitty situation. But this is also a reason I've decided to spend additional time outside of the hospital building the business. I suspect that my time in medicine has a shelf life and that life like this isn't sustainable for a 40 year career. I don't wanna be 45 years old, sleeping in a call room with no ventilation, missing my wife and three kids at home, only to be called at 2.30 a.m. for a nonsensical case. I don't wanna become that jaded, angry doctor that I've seen so often again and again. I don't wanna be at the basketball game the next day, post call while my daughter has a playoff game, only to be frustrated without sleep and just not my best self for the people that mean the most to me. I'm honestly worried about that because that already happens today and I'm still young. And so there may be a time where I choose to leave medicine, but that time is not today. There are enough reasons I'm choosing to stay. If you like this video, maybe I convinced you to go full steam ahead with your doctor dreams. If so, you'll love this video about the 10 truths I wish I knew when I started my pre-med journey as a freshman at UCLA. That video is here. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.